as already uh, introduced, my name is Amanda Gatherer. I'm the Chief Psychologist at Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust. And I've been asked to uh, talk to you today about the work we've been doing around psychological staff support. Uh, and um, during the, the during and since, well, in the in the aftermath of the initial kind of COVID emergency response. Uh, so um, what I would like to do is is really sort of talk a little bit through the process that we've gone through going all the way back to the week commencing the 8th of March when we were first asked to start doing some thinking in this area. Um, I think that's probably the best way of, of, of me presenting it to you. So we had a number of requests that came in from the week of the 8th of March uh, over the next two to three weeks. And in the end, the full scope of our offer was, was quite broad. So the initial request came from our colleagues at our large acute uh, trust, health trust, UA, University Hospitals Birmingham, uh, who run four hospitals in the Birmingham and Solihull area. I'm probably talking about a staff group of well over 20,000, um, as I say, across four hospital sites. Uh, so quite a significant um, challenge to think about how we might put together a, a plan for psychological staff support, working alongside and with their um, pre-existing counselling and wellbeing services. Then shortly after that, we were asked to, I was asked to lead a piece of work, I guess, drawing a fair bit on what we were doing um, across the four UHB hospitals in terms of planning staff support for the Birmingham Nightingale facility that was being developed uh, at the NEC site. And uh, so, so that was, became the second part of our, our challenge. And then again, very quickly after that, we were asked to extend our thinking to a combined authorities mortuary facility that was also being developed specifically in relation to COVID uh, as part of the multi-agency COVID response. And that was being um, that was very much a multi-agency initiative being built uh, on the Birmingham Airport site. Uh, interestingly, in the old Fly B hangar, um, and so immediately we were asked to extend our thinking to how might we incorporate uh, a psychological support offer for staff who might be involved, uh, particularly in delivering that facility. Um, so I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that we experienced, but, but most importantly, the model that we developed that enabled us to um, offer, offer input to each of those, across each of those areas. Obviously, in amongst that was, was the challenge of thinking about um, the support to our own staff within the mental health trusts. And again, we're a large mental health trust, multi-sites, multiple sites. Um, and uh, as you will all be aware, we, we um, were um, expecting to uh, be asking our staff to manage patients who were COVID, um, experiencing COVID symptoms and COVID live areas and COVID cohort areas that, that we were starting to think about developing. And the challenges for mental health trust staff were expected to be quite significant in that we would be asking them to do a fair amount of nursing care for patients' physical health needs and potentially experiencing the death of patients through COVID that we wouldn't normally expect to see within our facilities. So the, the, in March, we, we set about trying to come up with a model of care that would um, in some, some ways lend itself to, to meeting the needs of staff across all of these areas. Um, we came up with a, an overall model um, that had two main objectives. Uh, one was around preventing, identifying and treating poor psychological adjustment and I suppose trying to identify and where possible prevent the development of ongoing post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. Um, the second element uh, should be number two on that slide. The second element is, was, was around drawing on um, opportunities to uh, assist staff in, in, in getting a sense of growth through the experience of, of, of working um, through this unprecedented time. Um, and um, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so in essence, our, our model um, ended up looking like this. We, we drew as much as we could on, on the pre-existing literature, a lot of which related to work being done in the military. Um, and that's probably the area that we had most learning from, the work of Professor Neil Greenberg, who, who subsequently has been called in by NHS England 
to guide our thinking about staff support um, has has very much was very much work we were already familiar with. Um, but uh, as I say, we've really benefited from from Professor Greenberg's generosity in sharing so much over the the first few weeks of of, of thinking in this area. So you'll see from this diagram that we we um, have tried to capture the preventing harm and the maximising recovery and growth concepts with on the left hand side um, work that we, we felt was needed in order to prevent, detect and treat uh, people who perhaps were not um, uh, adjusting well. But also on the right hand side, um, how do you enable your staff to be having psychologically savvy conversations uh, in order to, as I say, maximise recovery and growth um, for, for staff. So just going through this, we, we came up with a, a five level model um, with the, the basic level being very much, a, a, and again, you'll all be very familiar with this work, uh, the basic um, basics around communication, resources, educational material. And there was a huge amount that came out that was shared nationally uh, in, in relation to this. There was national and local resources, there was uh, text and telephone helplines set up, particularly for healthcare staff. Uh, a number of organisations will have significantly increased their offer to staff around employer assistant programmes. Um, and I've seen a number of different examples from different organisations of posters, handbooks, resources. A lot of um, apps and resources were made available um, for free to NHS staff. And um, the challenge became, uh, how do you help staff navigate this plethora of material that, that, that was out there? So um, we encouraged the organisations we were working with to um, do their own filtering, really, and help staff to guide staff toward the resources that we thought were particularly, would be particularly um, relevant and, and helpful. Uh, and so that, that became the challenge at level zero. Uh, uh, it wasn't a lack of resources, it was more how do you get to the stuff that, that perhaps is going to be most helpful. Then moving up to, to level one, um, we were here really focusing on Professor Greenberg's model around building as much resilience uh, and coping within teams. So we didn't want to have a model that was basically um, fundamentally about parachuting in support. We, we saw this as a real opportunity. Uh, to uh, increase psychological knowledge and support structures within teams. Peer-led staff support became a real key focus here. And one of the things that we have managed to do uh, is, is embed the concept of psychological first aid across a number of the staff groups that we were working with. Um, the, uh, the other thing we've been encouraging is the setting up of staff drop-ins, psychological wellbeing um, f facilities. Um, and certainly across the UHB hospitals, those were hugely popular, hugely successful. And a, a lot of the credit for that has to go to the UHB leadership team who were very willing to identify safe rooms, uh, environment for, 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 for those wellbeing clinics to be, uh, to be uh, delivered within uh, an area for staff in the hospital to go to that, where they could access support if they wanted to, but there was a nice cup of coffee. Some, there was a lot of donations came in, a lot of, a lot of free stuff available to NHS, but again, the wellbeing drop-in facilities allowed for a kind of more uh, coordinated approach to, to distributing some of that. So these became areas where staff could really take some time out and access support if they, if they wanted to through the, the now trained up psychological first aiders. Moving up to, to level two, I guess there we wanted to make sure that managers, leaders, supervisors were able to have the right type of conversations to steal Professor Greenberg's um, phrase, psychologically savvy conversations, to make sure that we were um, able to support and, and identify those who might be struggling more. Um, and that level two in this model is very much about, let's nip things in the bud. If we can have those conversations and encourage people to speak openly about the experience of the work they're doing, and if we have managers and supervisors who know how to respond and facilitate those conversations, then we should be able to ensure that people feel supported, feel that they're, uh, they're able to, to manage things themselves and, and um, uh, carry on functioning in, in a positive way, both within their clinical work and outside of it. Levels three and four of the model are really there to make sure that we're, we're able to offer triage assessment, appropriate triage assessment for people who really are struggling for, for whatever reason. 
And again, um, we use the pre-existing uh, model of tra trauma risk management, uh, TRIM, uh, and we were very fortunate that we, we already had an infrastructure for that in, in a number of the facilities we were working with. TRIM provides a, a, um, a trauma-focused uh, triage process, protocol, which enables you to monitor people over a short period of time and if necessary, navigate people into what we've put here as level four more specialist interventions. But the majority of people supported through TRIM, the TRIM process won't need that if, if TRIM is, is available to them at the right point in time. And, and level four is, is, is really for that very small number of staff to make sure that they have access to either mental health crisis support if that's needed or specialist trauma interventions. So that was our basic model. Um, given, given time, I, all I've done is really draw out some of the key principles for, for being able to deliver this model. Um, one of which was making sure that we had the basic needs covered, uh, uh, very much taking a Maslow's hierarchy approach. Now, if you make sure that people have access to things that they need to physically function, food, PPE obviously was a mass, has been a massive issue, an area where they can get away and rest and feel supported and nurtured. So getting the, the staff drop-in and wellbeing centres set up was a, was a really important part of, of what's been needed over the past three to four months. Not necessarily what will be needed in the future, but investing in individual and team resilience, we chose a model of psychological first aid for that, um, as well as, as ensuring that our managers were able to have, have these savvy conversations. Good, clear communications so staff could access self-help without needing to put too much effort into finding the right things. Um, an early focus on normalising, supporting and monitoring was, was key. And again, using your psychological first aid and trim trained staff to, to create that, that support and escalation pathways where, where, where those were, would be needed. Um, to, to access appropriate evidence-based therapies and a lot of the pre-existing occupational health models wouldn't necessarily guide people into appropriate um, evidence-based therapies for the kind of traumatic experience that they'd had. So we had to do a little bit of scoping of, of, of what was already on offer and was it, was it suitable and if not what could replace it. Um, so we, we I think have had a, a successful approach to, to this and, and there were some key enablers for that um, and I appreciate that for many of you you either had these enablers or you didn't so but, but in terms of our learning and reflecting the early requests that we had from colleagues at UHB the chief coroner NHS England in relation to the Nightingale and West Midlands police in relation to the mortuary being asked to um, design and plan um, and do the thinking around setting up the uh, staff support from a very early point really got us got us um, up and running uh, before the staff were absolutely totally overwhelmed by by um, the the COVID response so that was really helpful we, we also were able to draw on partners other mental health partners uh, for example colleagues at Coventry Warwick Partnership Trust to to support us where we were looking at putting input into shared facilities like the Nightingale and the, and the Mortuary we had psychologists already embedded across the UHB sites that made a massive difference. Um, so we already had psychologists on the wards with access to um, clinical staff working across all four hospitals. Um, and I think sometimes just getting through the front door can be the challenge. So we were already in, in, inside the facility across the four hospitals. And also our close links with the coroner's office and NHS England enabled us to hit the ground running when it came to the Nightingale and the, and the mortuary facility. And also, and many of you may have found this, and these are all kind of connected, that, that because a lot of our standard mental health and, and clinical psychology provision were, was put on hold, we were able to redeploy a lot of staff into, into focusing on the staff support offer. Um, and that, that was hugely helpful. It's become more challenging as we've started to uh, initiate some of those services again, when, when psychology staff who've been key to, to delivering this have now started to just move back into, as they are now, just starting to move back into delivering some of their routine clinical services. It's, it's obviously created a bit of a challenge for us, which we're having to, to think about now. Of, of, do we need new resources to come and sustain what, 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 what's required for, for staff support for the, for the next few months to, to year? Um, we also 
we're lucky in that we're already quite familiar with the existing literature. We've done a lot of work around trim, Schwartz rounds. Um, as I say, we, we already had some links into uh, NHS England and um, local, with, work, we had been working with the police, for example, around trim as an approach to dealing with trauma, traumatic incidents. Um, and we were able to draw on some of our really strong partnerships with things like the Institute of Mental Health at, at, at Birmingham University and lo other local trusts, uh, as well as having independent psychological practitioners on, on standby. Um, so we, we really did need our partners to come and help us to deliver some of this and do the thinking around, around some of this, which was um, a very reassuring exercise that, that when, when, you know, when we needed, needed it, we, we were all able to pull together. I think it was an extraordinary, I'm sure you've all got your examples of this, it was an extraordinary example of how everyone pulled together and um, the, the normal kind of cross-agency barriers and challenges seemed to be sent on holiday for, for a few months. The, the psychological growth bit is quite interesting. I've got a slide specifically on this um, because we decided to use, I think this is quite innovative, we decided to use psychological growth, post-traumatic growth, um, uh, the post-traumatic post growth um, uh, literature to develop some training which we're now just rolling out to our managers um, and leaders across the, the various agencies. Uh, we chose this as a model for our psychologically savvy conversations. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of, of evidence yet as to how far that's, that's been helpful, but we've certainly found that it has quite a face validity. That managers who've, who've had that training have, have felt that it would be useful to them. And at least it's an empirical model. The post-traumatic growth uh, literature provides an empirical model on which to, to test this out. Um, so, so hopefully that's something that we'll be able to do some further further work on. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of, of the work we've been doing. I'm more than happy to take any questions or do some thinking uh, with you in relation to challenges that you've had or got um, in, in relation to this area and particularly thinking about what the offer needs to look like as we move into trying to balance the, the impact of um, the COVID response on staff the uncertainty of a future, what future COVID response might look like, as well as getting back to a bit more of the, a lot more of the business as usual and some of the challenges that that poses. Thank you very much. Lovely, thank you, Amanda. So we have had one question come in and it's based on the five levels of um, resources that, you, that you've that um, you established. And it's, it's clear that they've been crucial during COVID. Which of those have showed the importance and the continued importance that should be um, implemented post COVID? So there's no going back on them. Yeah, I think I've used the phrase no going back um, in, in a number of uh, webinars and events that, that, you know, what what will be the, what's the learning that we need to take forward? Where's the kind of sustainable change here in terms of the support we offer to our staff? And I'd say there's kind of three areas. Um, one is that the initial response at level one, I think has now been back downscaled. Um, the, uh, the sustainability of, of the type of staff drop-ins that we were offering between kind of March, April, May, June is it, it, clearly that's not sustainable. Um, and uh, staff themselves, I think, have recognised that they don't necessarily need that as an ongoing, um, you know, the access to these facilities quite in the same way when we think about their ongoing needs. However, we are encouraging organisations to keep a cohort of psychological first aiders, uh, to keep refreshing their cohort of psychological first aiders, because these are individuals who are within the teams and making sure that uh, keeping an eye out and ear to the ground, so to speak, in, in relation to their colleagues and just making sure that those conversations about how you're doing, how you're coping, maybe looking for some of the early signs that someone might be struggling, that that, that will be an, on, an important ongoing part of a, a, a staff support for the future. The, um, the second area that we're, we've been uh, very much thinking about is how do we sustain, I think what we describe as levels two to four of, of this model, um, how do we make sure that where you've got um, somebody who's, who, for whom there are concerns, that they've got a fairly rapid, seamless access to not just the right kind of assessment, but also um, the treatment interventions that they might require. And one of the challenges is that our standard mental health services are not going to be able to 
really manage any increase, the much increase in demand that might come from health and social care staff. Just bear in mind what we've been offering here across the different agencies. Um, we haven't necessarily been focusing on the whole range of social care uh, facilities as well, where, where there's a significant need. So um, what we're encouraging uh, commissioning groups and um, STPs to, to look at is, do you need to be commissioning something that is bespoke, particularly to deliver the ele elements of level two and, and certainly the, the three and four. And we've scoped local organisations, mental health trusts, who've all been saying, we are of course motivated to want to support staff and provide psychological support and the intervention to staff from health and social care. In, in our locality, but we're really concerned that we're going to have an increased demand. We've accumulated increased demand during the, the, the time where we've not been necessarily running our routine services the same way. We will not have the capacity to prioritise staff. So we're encouraging local commissioners to really think about the um, pathway into uh, more specialist psychological support for, um, for health staff and also to start looking at what do social care staff need um, and, and this, that takes me on to my third point, that um, if you've got levels zero and one very well established, then the number of staff needing to move up this pyramid will be less. In some of our social care facilities, um, care homes, for example, residential set care settings, um, you, we can't assume that they'll necessarily have had the same input at levels zero and one that our health colleagues have had. Um, and so there may be a greater need for, for higher level support. So um, we're just in the process of scoping that. And um, very keen that, 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 some, that there's some specialist commissioning um, being, being looked at to make sure that people aren't just adding to and be, having to wait for months and months for that support through the local mental health trust. Um, clearly we want to, to minimize any deterioration for, for health and social care colleagues. Um, and so rapid access to psychological care, assessment of care and, 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 and guidance is going to be really key for that. So I don't know if that quite answers specifically that answers the question, but there's a number of considerations that we're encouraging people to, 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 to bear in mind in conversations with local commissioners, because I do think, certainly in the Midlands, we've, we've concluded that, well, certainly in the West Midlands, I should say, we've concluded that we, we do need to be looking at something bespoke. For health and social care staff at least over the next year or so brilliant thank you your presentation has been very insightful and thought-provoking i'm sure there are other questions that are going to come through unfortunately we don't have time today but i'll forward those on to you and if you're able to respond i'll share the the um, feedback on those questions with our delegates from today's um conference so thank you very much we're going to go back to the main session now thank you very much cheers bye-bye